Welcome back everyone. Well, it's been an exciting morning so far. Now, in this next session, we will concentrate more on palliative care in certain groups of non-cancer patients. Now, our next speaker is actually now quite well known to you, and he's none other than our MC this morning, Dr. Saiful. Dr. Saiful Adni Abdul Latif is a palliative physician currently working in Hospital Malacca. He graduated from University of Leicester and completed his subspecialty training in 2021, having worked in Hospital Slayang, HKL, IKN Putrajaya and UMMC throughout his training period. He also completed a fellowship program with the Medical Training Initiative under the Royal College of Physician London at St. Benedict's Hospice Centre. Hospice Centre for Specialist Palliative Care in Sunderland, United Kingdom, as part of his subspecialty training. Dr. Saifu will be talking about palliative care in Parkinson's disease. Please welcome Dr. Saifu. Hello, everyone. Good morning. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk for this year's Malaysian Hospice Conference. So I've been given the task to talk about palliative care in Parkinson's disease. This is a topic that is not normally discussed uh, in our palliative care discussions before, but not to say that it is not important because Parkinson's disease is quite a common disease that we face in our day-to-day -day clinical setting. And a lot of these patients actually do require palliative care at some point of their illness. So I will start by giving an overview about what Parkinson's disease, and then we'll talk about the progression of the disease, as well as the palliative care needs that are important for patients with Parkinson's disease. Then we'll talk about some pharmacological issues in terms of treatments of patients with Parkinson's disease who need palliative care, as well as the practical issues that might also be involved. So moving on to the first bit. Specific region of the brain that we call the substantia nigra. And because of this depletion of dopamine as well as the part of the brain, you get certain types of symptoms that are related to Parkinson's disease. It normally starts with slowing of the movements as well as having tremor. And these tremors are usually happening at rest. They're usually described as pill rolling tremors of the hands, but sometimes you may get or see other types of tremors too. And because of these problems with movements, patients do suffer from rigidity as well and they get limb stiffness. And like I mentioned earlier, there's slowing of the movement. You get slowness and paucity of movement, sometimes what we describe as bradykinesia or even hypokinesia. And over time, patients will then develop some of the problems that are related to gait and balance problems as well, leading to postural instability. And as you can imagine, that will lead to further complications for these patients with Parkinson's disease. And in addition to the movement-related symptoms, patients with Parkinson's disease may also get non-motor associated symptoms too. So people with Parkinson's disease are often more impacted by their non-motor symptoms then their motor symptoms. And examples of these non-motor symptoms include depression, anxiety, apathy, hallucinations, constipations, orthostatic hypotension, sleep disorders, loss of sense of smell, as well as a variety of cognitive impairment that may or may not be associated with dementia. How is Parkinson's disease classified in terms of stages? The hernia scale is a commonly used system for describing how symptoms of Parkinson's disease usually progress. It was originally published in 1967 and it described the first part of stage one where one might develop early signs of tremor which is usually unilateral before going into the second stage where the symptom worsen and affect both sides of the body. Uh, you might notice some changes in terms of walking and moving, um, but there's no impairment in terms of balance. Then they go into stage three, where they'll start having loss of balance, 
and mild to moderate disease, but they remain still physically independent. Once they get into stage four, it, you might notice some severe disability, but they're still able to Age five is where most of the patients start developing problems because they need a wheelchair or become better help with And the thing about palliative care and Parkinson's disease is that there's a classic relationship of Parkinson's disease with other diseases that are normally looked after by palliative care physicians. These are the fact that Parkinson's disease is incurable in nature. There are some treatments that can be given to control the disease, but over time the disease will still progress. And most of the treatment are symptomatic in nature. But the thing that we need to look at is that there's a lack of focus on suffering for these patients as the progression of the disease continue on. There are, as you can understand, significant caregiver strain as the patients get more and more dependent on activities of daily living. And there are a lot of social and emotional aspects that are frequently a large detriment to quality of life. And in advanced Parkinson's disease, treatment, especially if they're given aggressively, can actually exacerbate some of these disabling symptoms that patients with Parkinson's disease suffer. But ironically, they are not routinely thought of as a terminal illness. And the prognosis is very much difficult compared to any other diseases because it is a relatively slow um, disease to, to, to progress. And, and sometimes it may uh, involve decades before the patient actually progressed to another stage of Parkinson's disease. And it, it is highly variable too in terms of the symptoms that patients suffer and the trajectory of disease or illness as well. And there are some barriers to why patients with Parkinson's disease are not normally referred to palliative care. Uh, first of all, we talk about clinician discomfort. Us as clinicians sometimes find it difficult to really point a time in which a palliative care refer referral can be appropriate for these patients. And that's poor integration and coordination of palliative care within the neurology setting for patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, whereas you can see that diseases with uh, much more disabling uh, symptoms and faster progression like motor neuron disease or multiple sclerosis gets identi get identified earlier on, patients with Parkinson's disease don't normally enjoy this kind of uh, privilege to be uh, known to other team members uh, for their illness. And caregivers usually indicate that physicians rarely discuss end-of-life expectations uh, for their family members with Parkinson's disease. And this is because of the unpredictability of the trajectory uh, that may actually have clinical plateaus and patient can retain a very low level of function for a long period of time. And as you can imagine, we, we then move on to talk about progression of patients with Parkinson's disease and their palliative care needs. So the progression of Parkinson's disease can take years, even decades, to actually move on from one stage to another. The point of diagnosis is usually at a point where bradykinesia, rigidity, and resting tremors start to develop. As well as that, patients normally complain of fatigue as well as pain. And over time, and this may take between 5, 10, 15, or maybe 20 years, patients then go on to develop further problems or complications that are related to the progression of disease, where you get frequent falls, where you get postural instability, and even worse, some of these patients may actually develop dementia or even psychosis due to the illness itself. And like I mentioned to you before, there's this period of time where treatment is started to control the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and you end up in this period of time that we call the honeymoon period. Patients actually uh, fare, they, they fare quite well during this period of time, um, but unfortunately, at, at some point of time, 
there's there's a tip of the progression where things start to worsen and you get some of these other symptoms that may actually indicate that patients may have poorer prognosis. So we then need to identify the needs for patients with Parkinson's disease who may need palliative care. How do we identify these patients? So there are some predictors for nursing home placement as well as predicting one-year mortality for patients with Parkinson's disease. First of all, is the development of dementia. About 40% of patients with Parkinson's disease develop dementia. And this is quite a significant risk factors that lead to them for being placed in a nursing home or even looking at their possibly one-year mortality. Some of them develop delirium, but delirium with visual hallucinations are quite common in the last years of life for patients with Parkinson's disease. Falls and infections tell you that the patient's stability and gait are becoming quite a problem for these patients. And the presence of worsening muscle rigidity, instability and dyskinesia despite best medical treatment usually tell you that these patients are not doing well in terms of their disease. And this usually increase risk factors of other problems such as um, opportunistic infections as well as fractures for this patient that lead to even more problems such as pressure ulcers and also contractures. And also patients may develop problems with eating and dysphagia. And this may occur from progression of motor symptoms or sometimes dementia. And this lead to recurrent hospitalizations and or uh, uh, developing aspiration pneumonias and problems like that. We can now move on to talking about the common problems that are faced by patients with Parkinson's disease. So some of these problems, so we're talking about physical problems. So some of these are usually pain and they can be having fatigue or daytime somnolence. Some of them actually do suffer from neuropsychiatric symptoms, having problems like I mentioned before about eating and dysphagia, as well as having too much secretion, so what we call siloria, as well as frequent falls. And I'll concentrate more on talking about pain, neuropsychiatric symptoms, eating and dysphagia, as well as cyanuria. As we can all imagine, fatigue, daytime somnolence, and falls are mostly problems that require us to try and tailor the way we look after these patients. And most of the issues surrounding these three problems are usually associated with physiotherapy, having a very good multidisciplinary team, and making sure all the assessment of the patient's home and the way they live are properly done so that the safety of the patient remain a particular concern uh, that we put on top. So we now go to the next part of this lecture where we talk about some of the pharmacological issues about patients with Parkinson's disease who need palliative care. So pain is a problem that is usually underreported in patients with Parkinson's disease. And they can be experiencing some form of pain that is related to their muscles because of the rigidity. Um, sometimes this problem can be related to their dopaminergic medications because these medications peak at different times and they last for, uh, for, for a different period of time for different patients too. If this is associated with off time, then we may need to look into either compliance or even altering the prescription of their dopaminergic medications. And we need to also prioritize some non-pharmacological approach in terms of management for immobility, uh, careful positioning, massages, physiotherapy, be it active or passive, are some of the things that we need to look at, as well as the use of pressure mattress to prevent uh, pressure ulcers from developing or worsening if it has already developed. Sometimes they do have severe pain that are not well addressed with conventional analgesia or even uh, a really bad pressure ulcer that is difficult to manage, then it's reasonable to think of opioids for these patients. And if the pain due to rigidity persists despite all of this, uh, then benzodiazepines also may have a role and this can either be uh, 
continuous infusion of midazolam, or even the use of clonazepam. And rigidity also is a concern that we can't just ignore. There may be specific times where patients may not be in terminal phase, but they have lost their oral access completely. And for some of these patients, sedating them may be undesirable for this group. Um, and this may happen to someone who is de deteriorating very slowly due to their underlying Parkinson's disease, or sometimes just have a very stable Parkinson's disease, but is deteriorating due to other problems such as cancer or other organ failure. And this is where reticotin patch come in. Um, there's a way to convert all of the patient's current dopaminergic medication into a dose of reticotin patch. Uh, and this can be done using an online calculator that is widely available. So parkinsonscalculator.com is the one used in Australia and pdmedcalc.co.uk is the one widely used in the UK. And this Transdermal patch is actually a dopamine agonist. It's available in a dosing of either two, four, six, and also eight milligrams in a 24 hour patch. Um, reduced doses are recommended if the patient has delirium or dementia, um, as, as dopamine agonists can increase confusion for this group of patients. They are also quite hematogenic. Uh, so especially at the first point of starting. So we may at some point need to consider the use of antiemetic medications. Um, but be careful because a lot of antiemetic medications don't uh, fit quite well with patients with Parkinson's disease because they are dopamine antagonists, most of them. And, and doses of these patches can be reviewed after about 72 hours if the rigidity is not well controlled for this group of patients. So now we get to the other point of some of these patients developing agitation and restlessness. Um, we need to assess for reversible causes of delirium, just like any other patients who are experiencing delirium. Um, but this is probably the trickiest symptom to address if we need to talk about medications to try and address the delirium if it is not reversible. Um, for, for this patient because all Parkinson's medication can cause an excessive delirium, especially when there is cognitive impairment. And what we need to talk about is that if, there's, if the risk of agitation outweighs the benefit of controlling rigidity or movement issues, then we need to gradually discontinue or reduce the dosages of their dopamine agonists. And if the dopaminergic medication has to be stopped, then we may need to think about starting these patients on infusion of midazolam between 5 to 10 milligrams in 24 hours to help them relieve the rigidity that they are experiencing. Try to avoid using haloperidol because haloperidol can actually, actually exacerbate uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. If the patient is able to swallow, putiapine is an option because it's the least likely to cause extra pyramidal symptoms. If somehow swallowing is impaired, benzodiazepine is probably a safer option, either giving it as a subcapitazolam or sublingual lorazepam. If the symptoms remain or worsen, we can consider the use of subcutaneous levomipromazine at lower doses because this is less harmful than using haloperidol uh, in terms of exacerbating symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Eating and dysphagia is a problem and it can be a long-term kind of problem for these patients. Multidisciplinary approach is highly recommended where occupational therapists can help you find ways to assist these patients with modified eating equipment to try and maintain some level of independence as long as we still can. Pharmacists can help to advise on the best formulation and sometimes methods to administer medications. Sometimes the use of thickness for fluids can also help these patients to swallow safely. Speech pathologists can also help to assess swallow and recommend diet modification if it's needed. And dietitian can help to try and monitor nutritional intake. Sialuria is quite a problem as well, and we can try non-pharmacological ways by encouraging regular swallowing and oral hygiene. But if medication is needed, the use of glycoperolate by mouth uh, uh, regularly 
uh, or sometimes using subcutaneous hyacinth uh, can be used uh, for these patients safely, even if they are in terminal care. Nausea and vomiting, like I mentioned, is quite a problem and it's almost similar to the problem that we have with agitation and restlessness because of the anti-dopaminergic actions of most of the medication that we use for this problem. This, the management is actually quite similar to the management of delirium, where you try to avoid the use of methylpropramide and haloperidol, but safer medications include using levomipromazine at a starting dose that is lower than usual, so either 3.125 to 6.25 milligrams on night, or the use of lanzapine, again, at a lower dose of 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams on night. Uh, some of the other antiemetics that are least likely to exacerbate Parkinson's disease are also Domperidon and Undancitron. But do bear in mind the use of Undancitron um, with apomorphine, which is one of the uh, Parkinson's medication that is widely used, is contraindicated. Now we get to the bit about practical issues of caring for patients with Parkinson's disease who need palliative care. There's a qualitative study that was done for patients with Parkinson's disease and their caregivers that was asking about would people with Parkinson's disease benefit from palliative care? And some of the themes that come out during this interview or qualitative study was that uh, the patient and caregiver surveys indicated that there's an emotional impact of the diagnosis itself. Staying socially connected becomes difficult having to endure some form of financial hardship because of the very long-term care that these patients need are also a problem. And finding help can sometimes be problematic for them too, as well as managing physical challenges. But the major difference uh, that they notice between Parkinson's disease and other diseases that are normally referred to palliative care is that Parkinson's disease is not usually considered a terminal disease. Um, and patients with Parkinson's disease themselves may not wish to see themselves as being terminal. Um, so how care can be properly given to this group is, is, is usually quite a difficult thing to talk about. But that doesn't mean we don't have to provide the care at all. That means we need to look more into it and the best way to approach these topics for the patients who need them. And there are some further recent evidence uh, that talk about the benefits of earlier palliative care referral uh, uh, for patients with Parkinson's disease. And it has been demonstrated by a recent randomized controlled trial with 210 patients and 175 caregivers. Although there were no significant difference that was observed in caregiver burden that tells you that the progression of disease is a real thing and it happens over time. But patients who receive additional palliative care have better quality of life, their symptoms are very much better controlled, and they are more likely to have an advanced care plan. So where do we then go from here? The lesson that we all need to learn is that there's an argument here for an early application of palliative care principles for patients with Parkinson's disease. And this need to continue throughout the entire disease progression and course. There are some stresses that are involved in advanced care planning, and this can involve um, carers and surrogate decision makers, but we need to be able to look at a point where these discussion can start. Uh, we need to find a point to start them. We need to explore for openness to talk about it. Um, a possible time that we can think of is when we see some of the complications starting to develop. And these kind of topic can be brought up either in the outpatient setting or when the patient is admitted for any form of complication that may or may not be life-threatening, but can tell us quite clearly that the patient is actually experiencing progression of their disease or illness. And then there's a possibility of role of combined clinic for a targeted group of patients, especially when symptoms management becomes a lot more apparent and would benefit the patients much more. And there need to be a continuous focus on communicating goals of care, as well as an advanced care planning for patients with Parkinson's disease who need palliative care.
In summary, we, ne we need to remember that Parkinson's disease is very common, but it's, an, it's under-recognized as being amenable to principle of palliative care. But in advanced disease, the care that this patient need is not too far different from other patients who need palliative care. We also need to look across the spectrum and put on a focus that palliative care shift can happen at any part of their disease or illness trajectory. There's a lot that we can offer here, but we need to know the common symptoms and causes. We need to have a very strong background in terms of knowledge because the way we apply our pharmacological knowledge may not be the same in the group of patients who need palliative care when they have Parkinson's disease and specific drug therapies may be different from our usual practices. So we need to be aware about that. So I hope that has given a very uh, thorough overview about what we need to learn about palliative care in Parkinson's disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Saifa. I found that really interesting uh, in the sense that, you know, um, for us, especially in community hospice, we don't come across Parkinson's often, but when we do, occasionally we're caught off guard. And I can see that the many medications that we normally use that would be, you know, contraindicated in, in, in patients with Parkinson's. Um, and also, um, as you said, how we can actually um, identify patients that actually would benefit from palliative care and also have the resources to be able to uh, provide these particular patient group with palliative care. So thank you for that, Dr. Saifo. Really interesting. We'll now move on to our next talk.